Hi everyone. Today we are going to start talking about geologic time. So in this lecture we are going to learn about the different ways we think about geologic time being the difference between relative age and numerical age. We are then going to use different geological principles that we're going to go over to determine the relative ages of um, geologic strata, as well as understand the basis for correlating formations and understanding the history of the geology in one location. So to start, uh, what's geologic time? The span of time since the formation of the earth, that is what we call geologic time. Um, but the cool thing about understanding geologic time is it's so much more than just a date. So understanding the age of something allows us to age fossils, structures, tectonic events that have all happened in the past. And when humans started to discover and also understand Earth's past and what has happened in Earth's past, it was a very big deal, it really altered the perception of where we thought we fit within the universe and within nature. So understanding the history of the Earth had a really big impact on um, the society, specifically the sciences um, of people in the world. So when we think of geologic time scale, so the time scale that we use to think of geologic past or the past of our Earth, there's two different ways to do it. So we can think about relative dating or absolute dating. So relative dating is where you establish an order or a sequence of events just using logic. So you don't know exactly the year or the date that something occurred, but you know that it's older or younger than the thing next to it, the thing above it, the thing beneath it. But you don't have any real dates or numbers. You're just using the pieces that you have to sort of piece together the puzzle. You don't know where that puzzle fits in terms of age, but you know the order or the sequence of events, the sequence in which things happened. Absolute dating, however, determines exactly when a specific event takes place. So this is actually measured in years. So absolute dating is when you put a year on something. So in order to understand geologic time scale and either way of dating um, a geologic formation or layer, there are many principles that we need to understand. So I have them listed here on the bottom left, um, but I'm going to go through them each. So they're really basic principles of understanding the geologic time scale. So relative age, we're going to start by talking about relative age. The next video will be about uh, numerical age. So relative age really allows us to come up with a story, come up with the history of a geologic location. So understanding the order in which things occurred tells us the story of that location. So you have to follow this sort of set of rules to unlock that story, to actually figure out what happened. So the first principle is called uniformitarianism. And this states that physical processes that we observe today operated the same way in geological past. So what this means is if we see footprints, we can assume or we know that they are in fact footprints. So these physical processes that we know of today are the same. Footprints are old footprints. Uh, cracks that look like mud cracks are mud cracks. So that one is pretty straightforward. Then we have the principles of horizontality and continuity. So we know that strata, specifically when we're talking about sedimentary rock, remember, it always forms horizontal sheets. So sedimentary rock is always laid horizontally or um, along flat along the Earth's surface. And erosion can then dissect or cut through those continuous layers. 
but knowing the principle of horizontality and continuity, we can say that these layers here match up perfectly with these layers here, meaning they were once connected. What has happened since is this middle part has eroded, so something like here. So we know that these layers are in fact the same layers and were once connected to these here, but they have er it's since eroded, so they aren't physically uh, connected anymore. But we know that they once were. We know that they were uh, laid and deposited at the same time. Now the principle of superposition. So in an undeformed sequence of layered rock, so an unaffected layer, la uh, sequence of layered rock, so there's been um, no deformation so far, we know that the oldest layer of rock is going to be at the bottom, and each one above it is younger. The youngest layer is always on the top, the oldest is always on the bottom. That's because first, the bottom layer was laid, you can't have the layer on top without this one already existing. So we know that the layer beneath is going to be older. We know the layers beneath are always older than the ones above. Then we have the principle of cross-cutting relations. So this is about intrusions, so volcanic intrusions. Uh, younger features cut across older features. What this means is if there is an intrusion, the thing that intruded is younger than what it intruded into. So for example, a volcano cannot intrude into rocks that aren't there yet. So if these layers were not here, we wouldn't have this dike here intruding into the rock layers. So this is, we can talk about faults, dikes, sills, erosion, uh, any evidence of some intrusion is going to be younger than the material that is intruded into or the material that is eroded or the material that has been faulted. So the thing that cuts through has to be younger than what it cuts through. Otherwise, there would be nothing to cut through. So in this case, let's look at this um, block diagram here. Which layer is oldest? Which layer is youngest? So using the principle of superposition, we know that K is going to be the youngest layer. So the youngest layer is going to be the one at the very top. This is the one that was deposited most recently. And we are going to practice this video and then also in the lab um, putting all of these orders in, t uh, it, putting all of these layers in order based on time from youngest to oldest. So now which layer is younger than the dike or layer um, F? So here is an intrusion, F. So we know that from the theory of cross-cutting relations, F intruded through layers A, B, C, D, and E, meaning that a, B, C, D, and E must be older than F. These layers must have already been here in order for F to intrude within them. So the layer that's, or layers that are younger than the intrusion would be G, H, I, J, and K. Because F did not intrude there. That means these didn't exist until after F had already intruded. So the next is the principle of baked contacts. So this is where we are talking about uh, metamorphism that's caused by igneous intrusions. So here we have a pluton. This very hot magma is causing a thermal metamorphism of the rock around it. So what this is saying is that the baked rock must have been there first. So this rock on the outside must have been in this location before the pluton. And we also have the principle of inclusions. So an inclusion is a piece of rock that is included within another rock. 
So this is something where there's been weathering and some rubble falls into a layer of rock. That rubble that fell in, it must have been older because it already existed. So if we have an igneous intrusion like this one here, we have sill. Here we have a sill with uh, inclusions of this yellow rock type here. It means that the yellow rock type is actually older than the sill. So this layer was already in existence because as this sill intruded from either side, we don't know which one, it will have uh, grabbed some of the yellow rock type and it would be included in that sill. So as this magma was cooling, some of this uh, rock layer fell in and cooled within it. So here is an example of where you might see um, an inclusion. So we would know that this rock existed first. This one is older because as this rock was hardening and solidifying, this piece fell into it. So this one must have already been there. So using all of those principles, we can put together the story of a location in terms of relative age. So remember, none of those principles are telling us anything about the actual age in terms of years or in terms of a number, but it's going to help us put things in order. It's going to help us understand what happened at that location. Have there been fault? Have there been faults? Have there been intrusions? So using those rules, we can take a diagram like this and figure out exactly what happened. So let's do that. So I'm going to go through step by step this diagram. It's the same one from this slide, and uh, walk you through how we go about understanding what happened at this location based on this profile. So first, this location started with the horizontal strata that was below sea level. So here we have the oldest layer, number one, the youngest layer, number eight. So we have layers one through eight. They were um, deposited uh, just like this in order from one to eight. But you will notice that our final diagram does not look like this. It's a lot messier. So let's figure out what happened and in what order. So here we have just layers one through eight. Let's see what happened to this nice undeformed horizontal strata. So the first thing is there was an igneous sill that intruded. So this igneous sill intruded between our layers four and five. And then that sill hardened, there was folding, uplift, and a little bit of erosion on the surface. So we start to see that folding pattern in all of our layers, including that sill. So because the sill is included in the folding pattern, we know that the sill was already there before the folding happened. After uh, the folding and even more erosion on the surface, we had a... Uh, magma intrusion. So here is an intrusion, an intrusion of a pluton. We know that since the pluton cuts through um, our sill and our layers, we know that uh, the sill was there first, but we notice that the pluton is not folded. It's not following that same folding pattern. So we know the pluton is younger than the folding. So the folding happened before the magma intrusion. And then we have faulting. So here we have um, a fault that cuts through our folded layers and our granite pluton. So we have our faulting. Let's think about what type of fault is this. When we were thinking about our fault types, the first thing to do, remember, is always figure out which one is the hanging wall, which one is the foot wall. Hmm. This side looks a little bit like a foot. Here are our toes. Here is the skinny ankle. So here is our foot wall, and from our arrows, we see that the hanging wall is moving down relative to our foot wall, meaning that this is a um, normal dip slip fault. So we had a normal dip slip fault that caused offsetting of our pluton and all of our layers. We then had a dike intruding. So a volcano intruded through all of our layers leaving this magma chamber. So you notice that in our final photo, 
this um, basalt dike is not affected by the fault. So the dike is not offset by the fault, meaning the fault happened before the dike was there. If the dike was there first, we would see an offset along that fault. So we know the fault happened first, and then the dike was after the faulting. Then we have a further erosion along the surface to get to our present day photo. So here we have our present day image. So that is um, how you go through to determine the geologic history of a location. So you can either, when you were given, for example, a diagram such as this, and you're asked to put different things in order, you can choose to either start from the oldest layer or from the youngest. So some people find it easier to start um, at the oldest topmost layer. Some people find it easiest to start at the oldest. So it's totally up to you. You will get some practice in your lab today. So here's another example. This is a satellite photo from Mars. So which happened first, the volcanic activity or the asteroid impacts? So here we have our volcano. We can see um, impacts from asteroids kind of all over the surface of this image. So to answer this, you think, okay, I see my volcano. I see my asteroids, but I also see asteroid impact on top of my volcano. That must mean the volcano was there first. The volcano was there first, and then the asteroids were able to hit it, leaving behind these impact craters on the side of that volcano. If the asteroid happened first, and then there was a volcano, we would not see the impact here. The volcano would actually probably cover up the asteroid impact completely. So let's go over um, quickly the different types of unconformity that we have talked about previously in class. So geologic records, of course, are not always perfect when we find a gap in our geologic record that is an unconformity. So that is a big unknown. So if you remember, we have angular unconformity, nonconformity, and also disconformity. So I have some photos. Um, the angular unconformity is where the layers beneath have been tilted uh, before the layers on top are deposited. So the layers beneath are tilted first, something occurs, there's some erosion, there's some tilting, and then more layers are placed on top. So we know that there is something missing in between these folded layers and the flat layers. A nonconformity is where we have sedimentary rock overlaying uh, either metamorphic or uh, igneous rock. So we know that something is missing there in between that, uh, in this case, igneous rock and those sedimentary layers. The last one is disconformity. So this one is probably the most difficult to pick out if you're actually in the field. This is where there's something missing, but it's between two sedimentary layers. So where our sedimentary layers might not be perfectly horizontally layered, that's where you would notice something must be missing here. There must have been some erosion. There must have been some disconformity. Otherwise, we would have those perfectly flat layers. So here you can see um, time one, we have uh, four layers that are underwater. And there's a future erosion site shown there for you. So then there's erosion of the surface. Cuts this layer a little bit on a diagonal. So then let's say now at time three, and we're looking at this column, we notice that uh, the contact between these two layers is not exactly horizontal. It's not parallel to the layers above and below it meaning there's something missing. We lost some information in between because these original layers are now gone from erosion. So understanding the principles, understanding relative age, and understanding the different types of unconformities allow us to correlate um, different sedimentary strata. So for example, here we have a picture of the Grand Canyon. 
So there are a lot of layers in the Grand Canyon, but there are also a lot of time gaps. So from just looking at the layers, we can, t we can say which came first, which came next, but we can't actually put a numerical date on any of those. So where we have exposed rock layers, we often call them formations. So where we have these exposed layers that we can see um, all the way across this image, for example, you might hear them called uh, formations. So these are rock units that are unique enough that they can be mapped over an entire region. So you can say this formation here, we know it's the same as here, at here, 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 and here. So you know that it's the same because it matches over that region. And these formations, once they are named, once they are mapped, once we realize they spread over a really long distance, they can actually be mapped and correlated over long uh, spatial distances. Now, with all of this understanding, we can also look at geologic maps. So geologic maps are great, but the thing to remember is when you're looking at a geologic map, for example, here's a cartoon geologic map, you are only looking at the distribution of rocks and rock types on Earth's surface. So you're seeing different formations, you're seeing rock types, you can see contacts, you can even see structures, but you're only seeing what is on the surface of the Earth. So here is the block diagram of this geologic map. So here uh, we have one rock type, here we have another rock type. When we notice that it is uh, actually the same, we realize this is a syncline hinge, we realize this is an anticline hinge. So the geologic map is great and using our um, correlations we can create really detailed geologic maps but we have to remember that it's only showing us what is right at the Earth's surface. So we are not seeing the layers beneath uh, when we are looking at a geologic map. Until you start to draw out your own block diagram because you have such a fantastic understanding of uh, geologic maps and relative geologic time. So here is uh, a fairly detailed but not super detailed geologic map of California. So they have incredibly detailed versions of this um, where you can go in and look at the exact uh, rock type on the surface of your neighborhood, for example. This is a rock type, uh, excuse me, a geologic map of California.